Hello, everybody. So I was instructed to speed this up as much as I can because we are kind of late on the schedule. Uh, so I'm going to skip everything. So the privacy goal is really well. It's going very well. It's not, never going to end because privacy is really hard. So uh, my current badge says that this is my first academy, <laughs> which, is, which is really, really cool. Uh, <laughs> especially since I've been a part of KD community for more than 10 years. So it's really nice to be first time with all your people. <laughs> it's a privacy feature. Yeah, it's, it's a privacy feature, so nobody, nobody knows that I've already been here. So uh, I'm wearing two hats, so I work on KD stuff and I work at one of the KD friendly companies. The reason why I'm giving this talk is that I'm currently the privacy goalkeeper, whatever that means. Uh, I invented the title. Uh, <laughs> it sounds really cool, right? So uh, the only takeaway that I want you to, uh, to remember when you go out of this room is that security and privacy are difficult. So this talk is going to be less about the goal itself. I'm going to cover several things, but the main thing that I want to stress is that security and privacy are very difficult. Now this slide doesn't convey the importance and the difficultness of, of privacy. So let's say extremely <laughs> difficult. So did you all remember these three sentences? <laughs> so the privacy goal started with the idea that in five years, KD software enables and promotes privacy. Now, I'm not really a marketing guy, so I hate sentences like these. Uh, for, for several reasons. They communicate that KD didn't care pri about privacy before, and that after these five years, we are going to be all of a sudden private, which is obviously not true. So an alternative is to say, well, we want the free software, our free software, to give us the fifth freedom. So the freedom to control where to control our data, uh, who we send the data to, etc. So what, uh, what risks do we have as people uh, when our data is compromised? Obviously, the most popular in the movie is identity theft, which is always cool, at least to watch other people <laughs> in, in that problem. Obviously, you wouldn't want uh, something, to, something like that to happen to you. Obviously, fraud, uh, then government fingerprinting, be, uh, they can follow your, uh, your behavior and recognize you just by seeing metadata about your behavior, etc. And obviously, blackmail, again, really cool for movies. So the next thing that is really cool in movies but not in the real life is on the professional side. So you have corporate espionage, which sounds really nice and uh, intellectual property theft <laughs> because of the espionage, etc. So the, the idea of KDE should not only be to protect uh, people's privacy, privacy, but also to give you, uh, to do something even for corporate environments. So as far as the data that can be used is concerned, we have metadata, small data, and big data. Uh, big data not in the sense of the buzzword big data, obviously. So what is metadata? Metadata is, let's say, not, not your name, not your surname, but, for example, the call logs from your, from your phone. So even if somebody doesn't know who is the person that you have been calling or uh, who is calling, they can track the behavior and then, then they can recognize you on the metadata itself. Then you have small data like your name, your surname, your, uh, that you like kayak, kayaking and stuff. So that they can show you advertisements and stuff. And obviously the big data, passwords for your bank account and anything else. And all of these levels need to be protected somehow. The main problem in the modern world Obviously, I don't want to sound like an um, anti-social person that we should all become hermits somewhere in mountains or something like that. But the problem is that today the social aspect of everything is 
crucial. Gamif gamification of everything forces you to always be online and to share everything that you can online. I had a friend that forgot to turn off, I think it was Twitter's feature, uh, that Twitter automatically publishes where she was. Just imagine how easy it would be for some really problematic person to just track the girl. So please don't use services like that. If you use services like that, at least make sure that you're not leaking the data unconsciously. Unconsciously. So, uh, as I said, the problem with the five-year goal is that it implies that we haven't had the same goal even before it was publicly announced. So, we had KRunner. One of the features that people often you, uh, wanted KRunner to have is like Ubuntu. I want just to start typing and it searches the internet. And as soon as somebody proposed that, all the Plasma team was, nope. It's, if you want to search something online, then you, will, you need to make an action before that says, okay, I want to search online. You don't want anything that you type on your, in your K-Runner to be sent to Amazon, Google, etc. And obviously, users hated us for it. Same thing happened to K-Mail a few times in the, in the history. The most recent one, the HTML bar on the left-hand side. In essence, K-Mail was always privacy focused and users sometimes hated it before it, uh, because of it. And obviously, Copeta, KTP and Conversation, the same story. Uh, unfortunately, most of those are not maintained today, but yeah, we can skip. Uh, then we have the new, uh, let's say, things in KD that respect privacy and improve privacy. Uh, K itinerary, I hope I spelled it correctly, uh, which is something that Volker is going to talk about, I think, tomorrow, tomorrow. Uh, plasma vaults, which nobody's going to talk about because I'm going to skip that. Uh, plasma vaults is, let's say, a secure way to keep your data in encrypted containers. Then we have Plasma Mobile as the idea that of, because all of the globalization and etc. Uh, currently, the applications on your, on your phones leak a lot of a lot of data to everybody, and Plasma Mobile, in some perfect world, would be an alternative OS that you could use instead of Android or iOS, which would be private by default. And obviously, projects like KD Telemetry, which will be privacy respecting telemetry uh, collection framework. Uh, a couple of other things that are being worked on, uh, integration of KD applications with Tor. So instead of just using the normal HTTP connections or even HTTPS, we could channel all the connections through Tor for greater anonymization. And one of the best things about KD is that uh, we offer a lot of applications that people can use instead of the, let's say, online counterparts which are not private by default. So for example, we have one of the greatest applications in KD, in KD was always Digicam. You don't need Picasso, you don't need whatever alternatives exist, you just need a Digicam. And we had Amarok, we had a lot of media players instead of going to YouTube and watching music videos. So this was quite uh, quickly going through several uh, privacy related things. Now since most of the people in the audience I assume are developers, raise your hands. <laughs> okay, I assumed correctly. Uh, a couple of really, really small and stupid things that nobody is concerned about and we should all be. So, as I said, peop users always, uh, often hate us because we value privacy. That doesn't mean that we should stop valuing privacy, just ignore the users. <laughs> so, I want to uh, demonstrate, a, to show a couple of security problems that 
existed in all KD applications until a few months ago and in most, in 99% of uh, applications in the whole world. Really stupid things. So, uh, QString is, is a class that obviously stores strings and it's a backend for the password entry widget. So, whenever you type a password in any Qt application on any, or anywhere else, it's going to be internally stored as a string. That's fine, right? While you're typing, it just changes the string. That, that's also fine. The problem is how the string behaves. So, uh, when you destruct a string, what happens to the previous contents? Absolutely nothing. Until something else takes the same memory and overwrites it, you still have your password in memory. So even if you destroy all the widgets, all the windows that you use to enter passwords, it's still in memory. The second thing, when, the, uh, when you type a long, long password, what happens? The string reallocates, copies the old data into a new buffer, so you have the previous value again in memory, and you have the new value in a separate part of the memory. And obviously, if you use swap, as soon as some, some of those uh, ends up on a swap, you even wrote the password on the hard drive. Do you think that that's a safe thing to do? So the first thing that you need to do is if you are destructing a queue string that was used for passwords, you need to zero out the memory before you call free or delete. And the second thing that you should try somehow to do is when you resize a string, uh, just pre-allocate enough memory to, uh, to save the, uh, any user's password in advance. So the current version of Qt zeroes out uh, the string data on the destruction of line edits if line edits are used as passwords. And it pre-allocates, I think, 64 characters uh, for the buffer in order to avoid the intermediary copies and resizing of the string. Obviously, that's not a complete fix because still, memory swapping is a danger, etc. So my advice for everybody here is think about these things. Don't use swaps. If you use swap, uh, then at least have an encrypted swap. So, we are running on a huge stack. We have CPU, we have operating system, we have our own program. And usually, at least in KD, we love programs that have plugins. So we are running even plugins. CPUs have bugs, as we have seen with Meltdown Spectre and everything uh, that happened to mostly Intel processors recently. The operating systems have bugs security issues, obviously our programs have bugs, and plugins can have even more bugs, and plugins can even have, can be malicious. Obviously, if we create our programs to run C++ plugins, then we are to blame. C++, a C++ plugin can do anything that it, that it likes. So if you're writing plugin-based uh, software which uses C++, then you need to ensure that only verified plugins can be run. If you are using something like, let's say, virtual machine plugins, like QML, etc., we should be safe, right? Because it's a VM. QML plugins should not be able to do anything, anything bad. Do we all agree on that? Of course not. Uh, if you provide just a limited set of APIs and you ensure that only those things can be executed, then we should be fine, right? Yeah. Nope. Because Qt provides the APIs that somebody from QML can use and abuse to steal your data. And I'm going to demonstrate something. And let's hope it works. So this is a password prompt. Uh, should I zoom in? So we have a password prompt. And if I say click me and start typing, we are leaking the password into the text, text field, which is fine. It's the same applet. It's obvious that 
that this applet can read its own data. That's fine, right? What's not fine is this. Let's try to connect here. Nope. I need something that will ask me for the password. Uh, Edge your own, probably the same. Hmm? Nope. Uh, this one? Okay. So we have a password entry. <laughs> and if I say click me, let's type in oh, for the <laughs> this is a password. And it I broke the code. So <laughs> We have a separate applet that just printed out the password from another applet. Because as all the UI widget toolkits do, you have a huge tree. And from any node in the tree, you can just traverse the whole graph and steal the data from everything else. This applies to Qt, QML, uh, QWidgets, QML, HTML, GTK, any other widget-based library. And nobody kind of thinks about these things. So even if you create an API set, sometimes the underlying toolkit allows you to do much more than what you think that, uh, that it allows. The question is how to fix something like this. Obviously, we can't really say it, tell cute people, OK, from QML, you should never be able to access a parent and children, etc. How should we fix this? Ideas welcome. So when you use plugins, don't. If you need to use plugins, again, don't. And if you really, really need to have a plugin-based system, at least add some kind of verification where you just install plugins that are verified by the developers of, that you trust. Don't install random stuff from even store KD.org. Don't install random stuff from GitHub, from malicioussoftware.com, etc., etc. <laughs> so, <clears throat> apart from security and privacy being really, really extremely hard, uh, think of it like this. Security and privacy need to come before usability, which is a strange thing to say, but even if users complain, even if users tell you, well, I know better than the developer, who is developing this application, don't trust the users. We are here to protect them, even if they don't want to be protected. Security and privacy before software design. Plugins are beautiful. Not having to recompile the application, just restart it with a different set of plugins is amazing. But don't. <laughs> and I'm, I'm also to blame for this. Almost all the applications that I created for KDE the first thing that I always did was create a plugin, plugin system. And security and privacy before anything else. You need to start thinking about these things before you even start writing the, your first line of code. Security and privacy cannot be an afterthought. And this is the last slide. I think I was fast enough. Questions? Maybe I have been already set up well. Yeah, of course. Um, okay. Um, my question would be um, given the example of, of the password uh, prompt from your network applet being snooped on by your other applet, how much of that could be solved through a multi process architecture? So taking a page out of the book of uh, web browsers these days. OK, so uh, multiple processes are obviously harder. Just like it's much harder to do something evil in a VM than in a normal C++ plugin, 
it's much harder to do something uh, relying on the OS problem than on the program problem, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So each of those levels that I've shown are e each level is by an order of magnitude harder to exploit than the previous one. Uh, with multiple processes, if you don't rely on uh, operating system bugs or CPU bugs, then you cannot do anything. But if you do rely on, uh, for example, CPU bugs like Meltdown, then you can steal absolutely whatever you want. Any more questions? How can we secure a plugin-based architecture? Uh, disable plugins. So obviously, if you just load the GPG signed plugins that are signed by Jonathan or somebody else. Whitelist. Yeah, whitelist. Uh, I've got a question that's come in on the KDE Facebook page, and it says, I'm loving KDE Neon, and I'm loving my ability to store passwords, but I've forgotten my password to the Plasma Vault I created. How can I find the data in it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, obviously. Uh, he just needs to send me d an email, and I'll tell him the backdoor is usually KD dot the date when the vault was created dot really, really secret password for the backdoor dot. <laughs> so for vaults, if you forget the password, you're screwed. Uh, as far as I can understand, most of those uh, privacy issues you're highlighting, they're basically post being pwned, like you already installed a Trojan. Should we even care about what happens after you already installed malicious hardware and you got hacked? Yes. Because I, I, would, I would say that's beyond our scope. I and mean, it's just people <coughs> shouldn't get hacked. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so if somebody already is installed a Trojan, then, well, who cares? Uh, <laughs> yeah, but most of your example requires already installing a Trojan, like, like installing a, a malicious plugin is a tro Trojan. I mean, otherwise... I, I do agree, but uh, we don't, we cater to users that are not tech savvy. S and users that are not tech savvy kind of often do things that are not advised. True, true but that, that can also be protected by the operating system like, like they do on, on Windows and they might do on, on future Linux distributions where you, you can't really install applications that easily without them being signed. Yeah, of course. But then uh, we would need to have a central authority that signs the packages, etc. The thing that I just wanted to add is that maybe we all have Trojans uh, in our CPUs. Because there are some, let's say, bi not binary blobs, but hardware blobs in CPUs, both Intel and AMD, which we have no idea what they're doing. Like the IME and PSP from AMD. So, we should try to protect users even from those things. In essence, we cannot uh, ever have a complete protection, but we can put some, let's say, safeguards to protect in most common use cases. Because okay. privacy is never complete. Okay, so thank you. Um. Uh, so, uh, there is just one question, more. <laughs> no, well, maybe. <laughs> so, uh, is, as far as I've heard, the question is, uh, am I suggesting to put down the store.kd.org? I'm not, but we should have some people that are whitelisting the things inside of the store. For, for wallpapers and stuff, it should be fairly safe unless somebody 
exploits uh, parsing of .NET desktop files, etc. But <coughs> for for more ser serious things, I would have a whitelister. <laughs> don't trust anything. Uh, don't don't trust anything. Least of all, Ivan. Um, no. Um, so the store situation is such that, given that all of the software for that is now hosted by KDE, um, anyone who would like to help with it, please get in touch, <laughs> uh, because that's a thing that we can totally make happen.